this week on the Back Table Podcast. I will, I will say that I'm, I try to be a lot more patient. I try to be a lot more understanding, especially when it comes to consent for care, consent for surgery. And there are a lot of folks where you're like, oh my gosh, why wouldn't you do this? Or why wouldn't you take this medication that I gave you? Why are you not compliant? And as opposed to just kind of laying it at their feet for them, assuming that they just don't want to do it or they're forgetful, you have to really understand what's the basis behind that decision. Is is there a distrust? Is there a barrier to, to getting the medication? Am I making it easy enough for them to get it? Am I making it easy enough for them to understand why I'm giving them the medication? So these are the things that go through the back of my head. Whenever I talk to a patient about a therapy, you get that look like that says, well, maybe I'm not going to do it. Maybe I'm not going to do it but to take it a step further and explore why am I getting that look. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Back Table ENT podcast, where we discuss all things ENT. Our goal is to bring you the best and brightest from our field with the hopes that you can take something from our show to your practice. My name is Gopi Shaw, and I'm a pediatric otolaryngologist, and today I have the pleasure to co-host with my fellowship director and mentor, Dr. Romaine Johnson, a pediatric otolaryngologist and airway guru at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas. You may remember him from previous Backtable ENT episodes on simulation for airway form body, pediatric tracheostomy, the long game, open airway surgery, and quality and safety in pediatric otolaryngology. Welcome back, Dr. Johnson. I can't help it. I know we said we're going to do first names, but you are always Dr. Johnson to me. Welcome to the show, Romaine. How are you today? This might be the first time I'm going to just keep just keep doing yeah. it. I can't help <laughs> That's it. That's okay. I mean, you could call me Dr. Johnson if you want. <laughs> There's a friend. His name is, I'm sure we've all heard of him, and I'm sure Dr. Chute knows him, Michael Stewart. He goes by Mickey Stewart, and he's always like, call me Mickey. And I'm like, no. Dr. Stewart, how are you? Great to see you, Dr. Stewart. <laughs> Even my emails, doctors. Yeah, so I get it. All right. We're going to introduce our guest today. We have Dr. Alex Chu. He is a rhinologist and skull base surgeon and the chair of otolaryngology at the University of Kansas Medical Center since 2016. Prior to this, he was the founding chair of the Department of Otolaryngology at the University of Arizona. He's here today to talk to us about Health Equity Collaborative. Welcome to the show, Dr. Chu. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me, Dr. Shaw All right. and Romaine. All right. That was the same thing when I started my <laughs> career. I, I'll call you Gopi. Thank you. I'm like, that's, that's just too weird. The listeners are even like, ooh, the ears are burning. <laughs> I started my career at Penn. So Dr. Kennedy first said, you can call me David. And at that time, I was like, there's no way I'm calling you David. It just sounds too weird. All right. So Dr. Chu, can you first tell us a little bit about yourself and your practice? I'm the itinerant academic surgeon, so I've been around a bit. Grew up in upstate New York, went into residency at, at Georgetown in D.C., and did a fellowship in science surgery when it was kind of its, in its nascent. So these days, if you're in, in the academic circles, there are some fellowships that just have a million fellowship programs out there, and rhinology is one of them. But back in 2002, there were only really two or three programs, and sinus surgery or frontal sinus surgery was kind of the unknown back then. So you did a fellowship to do frontal sinus surgery. And I was lucky enough to start my career doing that and then really getting into the skull base surgery at its early stages, which for me, it just fell into the right place, right time. And that kind of made my career for me. And so now I'm not that old, but I feel old, I feel a little bit of a veteran status where my joys now are in program building and then helping others get to where they want to go. All right. Well, I'm excited about our topic today because I think there's a lot of importance to it and a lot of value. We're going to be talking about health equity and a health equity collaborative. Can you first tell us a little bit about what health equity means to you? And of course, Dr. Johnson, jump in any time. And, it, you know, it, it's become sort of this buzzword. It's become a lot more important in the last couple of years. So why are we talking about it and what is it? Yeah, and Romaine, please jump in because I don't want to portray myself as a content expert in this. It's a field in which I feel passion for. It's a field in which the folks that, that work with me and, and that work with me are passionate about. And so I feel like I have some ability to help kind of put together people together in a movement that's needed because this work is extremely difficult and it's local. There's a lot of effort, a lot of people that need to be involved with this work. And so uh, I always have to remind myself the difference, to be honest with you, between equality and equity. And I always think, oh gosh, you know, if we're giving everyone the same opportunities and we're giving them access and we're, we're being culturally aware and we're open to different people and we're colorblind, so on and so forth. That's good enough. And that's not good enough. We know that's not good enough. We have to be color conscious and we have to be conscious of the circumstances that people have and the things they need in order to get to their optimal health. 
And so to me, I always have to think of the analogy. We've all seen them when we compare equity and equality. And for me, the one that, that's easiest for me to understand is the apple on the tree, right? So you've got a, a piece of fruit on the tree, and that piece of fruit really represents the optimal health for a patient. And you got three folks who are trying to pick that apple. One is really tall, six foot five. The other one's five foot eight. And the other one is, is five foot three. And so we need to give them different boxes to stand on so they all can get to their optimal health. And that's often what I try to think about whenever I, I remind myself about equity. And that's a perfect definition. When Gopi reached out to me, Dr. Shaw and I, we've known each other probably 10 years from now. I don't, I don't know, it seems. And she's like, hey, let's do another podcast. And she had these various ideas. And one of them was about equity. Oh, and by the way, you're like a 10 podcast. Me, I'm number I'm number one after like five years of the back table we had tea, so saw that? I'm glad I finally made it. What, what, how well, did you peruse there'll that? There'll be more. Don't worry. It, it's like if you start reviewing articles, you know, for journals, and it's like, oh, you want, a, you want some more articles to review? We got some articles for you to review. But uh, yeah, I think, you know, I, I thought of you instantly because, you know, we met earlier in the year and also we met last year at some of the meetings. You're trying to build this this equity collaborative. And I thought that's perfect because one of the things is not to use the word marketing, but how do you, how do you reach your audience? So, you know, I take care of a lot of sick kids with tracheostomies and a lot of them are disadvantaged. And I've been recently thinking about like, how can we reach that audience, reach that population? And, you know, you got various ways of doing it and podcasts and things like that. And I thought, well, you know, we want more people to get involved in this equity initiative. And I thought, hey, this will be a good opportunity to, to let folks know about it and, and talk about it more. Absolutely. You know, when I think of equity, I always have to think about the apple on the tree and the, the picture with the kids standing on the box, right? Another way I kind of think about it is kids and grades. Like, I'm like, oh, my kids are so smart. But I'm like, is it that they're smart or, you know, we are able to send them to school every day. They have, you know, their lights are turned on. We have food on the table, unlimited amount of food. And and so for me, sometimes that's an e even another way or another example to kind of think about the different circumstances that people have. And then I'm like, well, it makes sense with the, you can even think of it the same way, whether it's the child with the tracheostomy, the medically complex child that, you know, has two different, you know, the one that has the family that can do all those things. And then one where the circumstances are very different, the trach outcomes are going to be different. We'll dig into those details, Gopi, but you're absolutely right. A lot of the equity work is always focused on the individual and not enough of it is focused on the community, the interpersonal relationships, society as a whole. And caregiver research, what goes into the support network for a lot of the diseases and, and conditions we see is, is woefully understudied. And you bring up woefully understudied. You have had a role as an editor in the American Journal of Rhinology and Allergy, as well as um, an ENT Today. What have you noticed? And Dr. Johnson, too, editor for the one of the laryngoscope journals, yes, the investigative laryngoscope journal. So in terms of the articles, and I know Dr. Johnson was just reviewing about 10 of them prior to starting this recording, what have y'all noticed um, in terms of specific research in otolaryngology and health equity? Romaine, please go ahead since you've been reading journals this morning. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because a lot of the articles really focus in on the disparity aspect and they're looking at, say, children with sleep apnea and they're saying, oh, well, black children have more severe sleep apnea and their revision rates are higher. And we're getting a lot of that right now. And people are using big data, they're using local data, but there aren't as many people looking at the idea behind equity and inclusion in the big picture, which is trying to decrease those things, bringing about a more just society. And that's where we're lacking. And actually, as a researcher, that is one of the things that I'm, I'm also starting to think about. Like, okay, we know that these disparities exist, what can we do to per make those disparities less? Like, so we looked at our kids at the children's hospital here in Dallas, and we saw that a lot of kids are making phone calls after tonsillectomy and coming to the emergency room. And then we realized that some of it was language barrier and that we weren't doing a good job communicating to patients who have a different language preference what their post-op instructions were. So they're calling us for simple things or they're coming to the emergency room because they didn't really know how to take their pain medicine post-op. So we started looking at initiatives to do a better job of having language preference, keeping that in mind and tracking it. And we're starting to see an impact, starting to see fewer people come to the emergency room 
for for because they didn't know how to take their pain medicine, getting fewer phone calls because actually that's a big deal. Like you get a lot of phone calls after tonsillectomies, <laughs> and you're seeing less of that as well in the research space. We're seeing we're still seeing a lot of the disparity. Like yeah, black folks ain't doing as great in, in this space, or people who live in rural communities have access issues. Like yeah, we know, but we're starting to see a little bit more of that. Okay, how do we address these inequities? How do we make them better? Yeah, and that was the start of why we wanted to put this collaborative together. We have a, a resident very interested in the why of why African American black patients have poor outcomes for head and neck cancer. And this is not new data. This is data that's been published back in 2012, decade old data that show that African American black patients consent less to surgery and have poor outcomes when you case control for staging of tumors. And so she's embarked on a qualitative study trying to understand, you know, what is it? that patients in Kansas City will will resist to have surgery. But that's a very local study, right? So in order to have a larger impact, we need to talk to friends and colleagues who are in Detroit, who are in Boston, who are in Dallas, to understand from their patient population, what's their perspective? What is the why? Why do we have these disparities? And what can we do from an intervention standpoint, which is really the next step? And Gopi, to your original question, there's a fair amount of literature describing the issues, especially on an individual basis. There's literally next to nothing in terms of intervention on the individual basis, but more importantly, uh, and with broader impact from a society level, from a community level, things that really make a change for large populations of patients. So on that note, do we want to kind of dive into what the Health Equity Collaborative is? Is this because both of you kind of alluded to caregiver research and sort of how do we reach our audience, community. And it's almost like we need to do a little bit more in terms of community outreach, too, with what we do. Is that, does the Health Equity Collaborative and community outreach, is it tie in together or are those different things? So I'll give you a little bit of background of the collaborative. So we started this back in February 2022. Our realization as we were going through this study I was just telling you about, about cancer and, and American, African-American black patients, is that we don't have enough patients in Kansas City that we treated that fit that study. So we started to reach out, and there are some prolific health equity or health disparities researchers. But in all honesty, a lot of them work at places that don't have that patient population, right? I worked at one of those places, and those places did not want to see patients who had lower socioeconomic status. So they're filled with brilliant researchers, but it's a little bit of a, of a shell of a card game. And I know people are going to be mad that I'm saying this, but we wanted folks who are in the trenches, who are actually taking care of these patients, who have a true passion for it, more than just a grant, more than just a publication for their CV, who really wanted to make an impact. So we started to talk to our friends, six of them, University of Mississippi, Henry Ford, Charles Moore, who does some phenomenal work in Atlanta, Georgia. We talked to Romaine a month or two later. And we got together, Rod Taylor from University of Maryland in Baltimore, and we started to say, what could we do at a local level to make the change, to try to have an impact? And we all agreed that getting data, understanding the data to be able to present it in a coherent fashion to our powers that be, their bosses, the decision makers who put policies in place in order to affect a change. And so our last year has really been about trying to agree on data metrics, and Romaine obviously has taken a lead on that to help us but then to institute that at our institutions. And the collaborative is not meant to be local or be small. It's meant to be big. We want everyone that has a passion for this to be involved. And our main goal is to be taken over by academy or by our societies. So they do, they help us do the work. This work is so incredibly hard. It comes and fits and spurts, but it needs someone pushing it. It really needs someone pushing it. And as much as I would love to take credit for it, I don't have the time or energy, to be honest with you, to, to be the only pusher. It needs to have 30, 40 people pushing this initiative. I want to just piggyback on the idea of the qualitative research method. And as an, an editor-in-chief, I do notice that some of the, I guess, larger, more reputable impact journals, they're reluctant to publish those studies because it's not the observational or randomized control trial or systematic review. Yet that data is so important because you're actually talking to the people on the ground who are experiencing, is it a resident who's pregnant and it wants to talk to you about what it means to be pregnant during their residency? Is it a, a patient with head and neck cancer? 
who lives in a disadvantaged community. That data is missing. And so as an EIC, I'll just tell you, for those who are listening, if you're doing that kind of research, send it my way. I'm very interested in it. And I think it has incredible value. It's not easy either, right? No. Qualitative research is not easy. It's incredibly difficult. So it is discipline to be able to pick up the themes through structured interviews of 40 people. It takes talent and effort. Yeah. So I was just going to ask you, so these, in terms of the qualitative data, how do you get that information? How do you create a form of questions or are y'all kind of working through some of that for this specific project? Because there's going to be lots of different projects. How do you come to that? And you probably expect some changes, like you're going to have to flex with that. The data probably isn't going to be so clean. No, absolutely not. And that is one of the criticisms for a mixed methodology. So we're talking mixed methodology in which you have this qualitative structured interview for each hypothesis, for each study. You're going to develop a set of questions. You're going to ask each participant. But then you're going to have to put an objective metric to those responses. And that's usually grouping them into themes. You know, mixed methodology papers are meant to kind of almost remain, they're almost meant to satisfy that editor journal out there that really wants hard data. Is that right? I mean, am I right in saying that? So you're saying it's not meant for those? No, it's really, I mean, for me, the purely qualitative studies are really meaningful. We both agree on that. Yeah. And the concept of mixed methodology of including objective data is important, but I almost feel like it was a response in order to get these these articles published. (laughs) Yes, yes. No, I think that's true. There is reluctance to, you know, it's this idea that it's someone's opinion. But so is a survey. It's someone's opinion. And there is real science behind developing these themes and asking structured questions. Think about right now, many programs are interviewing medical students to be applicants. What's one of the common things we get is that, hey, you need to really start asking structured questions. In a way, that's kind of a qualitative study. You know, we're asking them, we feel like Their board scores, their letters of recommendation, all those things are important, but there are certain biases and all that, and they don't necessarily predict how they're going to do as a resident. So what makes a good resident? What's their work ethic? Are they good at communicating? Can they problem solve? How do they handle adversity? Like if they have a major complication, are they going to come back to work the next day? (laughs) Are they going to be able to get, figure out how to get over it and learn from it? Asking those structured questions you start to develop themes. You start to see who are the candidates who are grounded and potentially have the potential to, to be a really great resident. Same thing with equity and dealing with patient populations that are hard to reach. You have a family that's taking care of a child who has a disability. You know, we do research on kids with disabilities quite a bit, but we rarely talk to the family about the impact of caring for that child with a disability. But yet knowing that and being able to address that will have a huge impact on the, fa- on the child's health, maybe more so than the medicine that you're prescribing. Absolutely. It's also, it's also that concept of community participatory research, right? If you're doing research that doesn't affect the patients you treat, who are you really helping, right? So you need to talk to the, your patients to understand what do they want out of your research? What do they want to see it change and how will it impact them? not someone that may be 5,000 miles away and not really be applicable, be apples to apples. Y'all, you had mentioned, Dr. Chu, that in terms of we want this initiative to be something that, you know, maybe the academy takes on, that, you know, you need, it's not a one-person thing. You need a lot of people, a system even. How do you get the support that you need? How do you bring in people and make sure that everybody's kind of on the same mission? So we started the collaborative paying people for their time. We put our money where our mouth is. We said this is important for us as a department. We truly believe in trying to make an impact in the community. We pay people. We pay people to show up for these sessions. We put on elaborate lunches or meals to try to get people together. And we found that that probably wasn't the way to do it. (laughs) I think that kind of fell flat. I think it's finding the right people who are, want to be involved. And I have to give credit to the Academy and Jim Denaney. They, out of more so out of any big national society, have really tried to step up. They've recently got a grant from GSK to fund, to fund a core award for the next three years looking at studies in health disparities. So they're really trying to make an effort. I would love our subspecialty societies to continue it. I know the Headneck Society is doing work, but I'm not quite sure if we're at where we need to be. 
And that's the drum I'll keep on beating and I'll keep on kind of making people uncomfortable when I say that. I want people that want to make a difference, just are not doing it just to be a publication or to do it in name only. And how do you find those people? How do you draw them in? How do they find out if they are interested? So we're open. So we gave a <laughs> mini, we would like anybody with a pulse right now, but um, we gave a mini seminar at the academy. We now have about 20 academic programs that are within the collaborative of varying degrees of involvement. Uh, we have our core group and we haven't gotten together probably in a couple months and we need to get together again, Romaine. So it comes in these kind of fits and ways. And if you know someone or if you're passionate about it, Kopi, we would love to include you because we imagine this collaborative, we're first in this data metric collecting phase, but we imagine every subspecialty can use the collaborative together to gather data and to impact their local subspecialty. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of people out there that are passionate about it. Again, trying to figure out ways to bring everyone together, but it's sometimes just word of mouth, like, you know, Dr. Chu sees me in the hallway. Hey, Romaine, guess what? We're having a little lunch. Why don't you come? And that intrinsic motivation on my part to be a part of organizations and groups and, and people who want to make the world more just and more equitable, I'm just going to be naturally inclined to do that. And I think there's a lot of us out there. So, it, yeah, it can be hard to connect us. But I don't want you to think that, oh, there, there's no interest. There's actually a, really a lot of interest. And the thing that I liked about the collaborative is you had representation from various schools. You had different specialties. And then you had different levels of experience. You have people who were department chairs, professors, and then medical students and advanced practice providers. And so, like, you can see the energy there. And it's like, okay, you got people in the room where it happens. And I think it's just very, it was, you, know, you could see the impact. I think that's exciting. And I think that's great to have the medical student involvement because the finger on, on the pulse is going to be students are going to have that and have that insight and hopefully something that they can continue to be passionate about. Do you guys have strategies in terms of how to communicate in, within the collaborative and keeping everybody sort of informed or engaged? How, how, how are you guys going to do that? Yeah, so so far it's been a series of Zoom calls. We plan on and having one big meeting at the academy every year. So I think the collaborative can rely on the fact that we're going to meet at the academy. The academy directorship will be there because, again, I think our master plan is to have the academy take this over. I think we just have to gain enough momentum start to show some fruits of our labor, start to show that we've been able to generate some data together, do some research studies together. And I, I do think the Academy will, will adopt it at some point. And then have you had any challenges that you've faced so far in getting the collaborative started and getting people on the same page or, you know? I would have to say that the people that are in the collaborative are just some of the most wonderful people I've met in otolaryngology. I, they are just truly big hearted people that are brilliant and eloquent and respectful of each other's <laughs> opinions. How many times have we been at society meetings and committees in which one or two people want to hog the scene? You don't have this in these collaboratives. Everyone's got a, a point to say, and, it could, and to Romaine's point, it could be the medical students. It could be the first year resident, and their opinion counts just as much as the academy EVP or the department chair. So uh, that is one of the true beautiful things about the collaborative. My experience is getting those good, smart objectives, all right? Those the specific, measurable, and time. And so I, I've been tasked with sort of working with the region folks. Region is a registry that the American Academy has for mostly private practitioners. Some universities use it as well. And seeing if we can extract data from region and create some kind of equity score or equity scorecard or something to give us information about, like, how are we doing when we treat our patients? Are we providing equitable care? And it's, it could be challenging, right? So you got to have your meeting, and then maybe the meeting gets canceled. And then you have your next meeting, and it's like you go through all the list of things, and like, okay, then you have the meeting after that. Like, well, guess what? We can only do two of those things because the other four were just not possible. Okay, let's focus in on that one thing. And the next thing you know, it's nine months later, you're like, okay, we got one thing. So uh, getting good data... And, and building something takes time and effort. You kind of have to stick to it. I think sometimes you want those early wins. And it, they always say it's important to have early wins. And I think for the collaborative, some of their early wins were just getting everybody together as well as getting the academy to agree like, yeah, we really should look into this. But now getting those next 
deep level wins, at least what I've been charged with, is uh, it's an ongoing project. You know, we, we talked about the Clover being research focused. Is the main focus going to be research? Will there be an education arm or an advocacy arm? I specifically about ask about the education arm because, and I think you kind of said it in the beginning, Dr. Chu, you know, I'm, I'm no expert on this, but uh, we all have a passion because there is, it's a big topic, but we all can relate at least to a piece of the topic. And sometimes on a very personal level, sometimes it's just professional, but we can kind of get it. Um, what Within this collaborative, going back to the original question, is it, will it be mostly research focused or will there, once it gets through maybe the academy, there'll be an education piece, a course piece, a reading articles or an advocacy piece with legislation that sometimes can take some of the stuff to the next level? It's a great comment and that's a great idea, Gopi. So the collaborative, when we initially got together, we wanted really two focuses. One was research and the other one was professional identity, recruitment of more underrepresented minorities into the field of otolaryngology. So we actually did some work around that. And the orthopedic surgery field has a very well-established program called the Nth Dimension, of which they've been very successful over the past five years, certainly more successful than our specialty in bringing people of, of color into orthopedic surgery. So we've started that dialogue. I know there are other folks who are working on that space as well. We've met with the nth dimension. There are some financial hurdles and that's, it always comes down to money, right? It always, always, always comes down to money. So how will we actually fund that? And that's where I'm hoping again that our bigger societies will, will step in and be able to fund this type of work. But education actually is something that we'll talk about as a collaborative. Should we be putting together anti-racism curriculums and equity? And a lot of this content is out there already but can we actually tailor it towards otolaryngology and, and can we find an audience out there where every resident, every medical student interested in otolaryngology takes a course or reads a curriculum and, and has this at the forefront of their mind as they're seeing patients every day. You know, when we think about ACGM programs on the evaluation that you do every year at ASS, you know, do you have formal teaching on how to teach, right? And then another question on diversity and inclusion within your department I wonder if in the future, things like health equity would become more of like part of required curriculum or, you know, there's more of a push in terms of talks on potentially on leadership, on professionalism, on communication, all of these other sort of non-clinical, we say softer, but these topics are actually sometimes harder, if you will, and, you know, make a, a larger impact overall on the individual and how they might practice and how they might live as well. You know, that came up at the, the American Board of Otolaryngology leadership retreat. What's the next continuing certification? They realized that taking an exam, and again, I don't, I mean, I'd say I, I don't speak for the board. <laughs> just to make that clear, I'm not, I'm just giving you my opinion of the conversations I've had with the board. I don't want Brian to call and be like, hey, Dr. Johnson, <laughs> you, uh, so these are the opinions of Dr. Johnson. But seriously, they, you know, they're interested in the questions of professionalism and judgment. How do you tackle that? And certainly justice and recognizing that having a strong sense of justice and fairness probably plays a role in being a good physician and being a physician who won't engage in behaviors that are detrimental to patients and the healthcare system and society as a whole. Absolutely. These things affect patient outcomes. And, you know, it circles back to all of these things affect patient care and outcomes. I was thinking, you know, in terms of the collaborative, we have people together. There's a research focus. You know, we've got some yeah, focus on how we're going to collect some of this data. You know, we know we need a support system that's going to be larger than the 20 people. We're going to need like our society and some sort of support from that stance. So in terms of, as you guys set this up, in terms of the long term, tell me about sort of the long term goals and impact that you see the collaborative having a specific to otolaryngology. Yeah, so I go back to otolaryngology having the least representation for underrepresented minorities. And part of the issues that we have is obviously is that we don't have representation in the, in the faculty and the attendings who are seeing these patients. And we'll probably have more passion for some of these projects when we have more representation as well. And I almost, I don't want to say this is a, that we're a bridge, but we are working towards that day when this should be the number one topic or, or 1A. And it's not. It, right now, it's number seven topic or eight topic on the mind of most otolaryngologists. And our goals is to make this 
to be the one or one A or one C topic and be at the forefront of everybody. And don't get me wrong, I've, I've got a wonderful department, but Kansas is not the most racially diverse area. It's also an area of low poverty. I used to work in Tucson, Arizona that had a 33% poverty rate. So the faculty in the two different locations think differently about their patients just because of the communities they live in. And so how do we make it where the Caucasian otolaryngologist who grew up in the Midwest and lived in the Midwest their whole life, how do we make it so it's 1A, 1B, 1C in their priority list when they're seeing patients? And I think that's the ultimate goal. Yeah, I think as we learn and get more information and educate ourselves and kind of stop to think, you're right, how do we think about our patients? How do we see our patients? And and I think getting to know our communities is important. You know, we, it's hard for patients to find us sometimes. It's hard to get access. So it's almost like, okay, we need to go access our communities. And it might be number seven on somebody's list. It might not even be on the next person's. And so I think these collaboratives kind of keep that this is important. Eventually, when you hear the word enough times, you have to kind of figure out why, why am I hearing this so much? Hey, Gopi, you're included in the collaborative. We're, we're putting you on the email <laughs> list right now. I used to, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> so we... <laughs> but we don't have a catchy name either. Maybe that's our problem. We, you know, we keep on calling the collaborative. Yeah. For me, it kind of brings up a James Bond movie or a Mission Impossible organization. <laughs> we, we need to have something a little bit more catchy, I think. And since starting the the collaborative and doing more in terms of research and things, have you made any changes in how you deliver care in your own personal and the way you practice? Yeah, I mean, I I will I will say that I'm, I try to be a lot more patient. I try to be a lot more understanding, especially when it comes to consent for care, consent for surgery. And there are a lot of folks where you're like, oh my gosh, why wouldn't you do this, or why wouldn't you take this medication that I gave you? Why are you not compliant? And as opposed to just kind of laying it at their feet for them, assuming that they just don't want to do it or they're forgetful, you have to really understand what's the basis behind that decision. Is is there distrust? Is there a barrier to, to getting the medication? Am I making it easy enough for them to get it? Am I making it easy enough for them to understand why I'm giving them the medication? So these are the things that go through the back of my head. Whenever I talk to a patient about a therapy, you get that look like that says, well, maybe I'm not going to do it. Maybe I'm not going to do it but to take it a step further and explore why am I getting that look. What other things can people do locally? So you're a leader in the field, and so there were stories being told about you in the triological leadership meeting because we were looking for a new editor-in-chief. You stepped down, and everyone's like, when you did your interview, you were, like, incredible, and everybody looked at each other and said, okay, interviews are over. We're hiring this guy. (laughs) And so you're a force of nature. And that, you know, I say all that to say that not everybody has the skill sets you have in terms of connecting the people. And But what can people do locally so they, they know it's important? How can they impact equity and inclusion at the local level if they're kind of starting out and maybe they don't have all those connections that, that you have and, and that others have? There are others within their places of practice and institution, family practice, population health department, school of medicine. They are so much more developed than we are as otolaryngology, especially in terms of this work. Public health. This is public health. Get involved with them. They have networks of participatory research groups routinely. I mean, we think about COVID vaccination and just about every academic medical center has studies looking at vaccine enrollment and that and those public health Uh, measures and those study techniques are the same things that could be used for otolaryngology, for HPV vaccine uptake. We talk about it all the time, but I don't know if we've really done a really good interventional study to try to increase HPV vaccine enrollment. So if you are a passionate person in this part, look to your neighbors, look to your other professionals in your institution, and you will find the expertise that you're looking for. Absolutely. I think that you bring up a interesting, you know, in terms of the HPV vaccine and pediatric otolaryngology, you know, we see it for the laryngeal papillomas and we have to counsel patients at that time. And then our head neck cancer colleagues that may or may not be in their conversation. I don't know. But, you know, obviously, even, you know, we don't I don't think I've gone through the vaccine list with my patient, something as simple as that in terms of thinking about sort of that overall picture when it comes to public health and safety and impact, even in, you know, in otolaryngology. And I love the surgery consent example, because as surgeons, I mean, that is, you know, how we consent, what we say, the questions 
that we ask, what we hear from our patients. Are we listening? I think that if there's one place to start, that might be the place. In terms of, you know, I'm really excited because I'm excited to that there's this initiative and collaborative and the data gathering because that's what allows for guidelines and national society recommendations. And it allows for advocacy, especially in the time of legislation, which doesn't always follow what, as physicians, what we recommend. So I think that this is something super exciting and it's great that it's coming from within the field of otolaryngology. Because I think that as we see lots of changes with legislation among different states, we shouldn't think that just because we're otolaryngologists, we're siloed and that these things won't affect us. All of these legislations affect us, whether it's directly (laughs) or indirectly, we're all affected by it. So I think it's great that there's more awareness as well as initiative and interventions. Before we round this out, What else am I missing? Any final questions or pearls? I will bring this back to what Romain initially talked about when he talked about medical student interviews. One of my favorite things when I talk to medical students, when they ask me the question, what are you looking for in a resident? And then my response is, I want you to be the same badass. Sorry, Gopi, but I swear a lot. So you're never going to invite me back again. This is a back table podcast. (laughs) You can laugh, you can swear, you can say whatever. (laughs) But I tell them, I I want you to remain to be the badass, impassioned, person that has principles and and high ethics and maintain that through residency and attending hood because don't become just, you know, a regular ENT resident that all they care about is how many tubes and tonsils and neck dissections they do. That's boring. That is so boring. So there are a lot of medical students, the young people out there who are passionate about disparities research that want to make a difference. And I just kind of plead with them, keep that same passion. It's hard to do it with 60 to 80 hour work weeks. But if you maintain that, that want to make the world a little better place, then guess what? You're going to be an attending that's going to keep that want to make this world a better place and not just do a bunch of cases, buy your Tesla, and then go home to your family. <laughs> <laughs> there's more to life, right? <laughs> Although I do, I would like a Tesla right now, but there's more to I life. had one and I really liked it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that is a challenge with otolaryngologists. So uh, there's been good research on people who achieve elite status for lack of a better term, tend to become more jaded over, not jaded, but tend to become more interested in maintaining their elite status over time. And so they start off, like they looked at law school students who are, you know, the ones who are very idealistic and hardworking, those students and the ones who rose to the top of their class and were like the top performers, over time, they became kind of more interested in being elite. And it's kind of this negative feedback. And I'm glad that Dr. Chu mentioned that, like, hey, one of our goals is to try to keep you grounded, to not forget when you sat across from me 10 years ago interviewing to be a student, and you said you were interested in global health and equity and justice and all these things. Yes. (laughs) To try to make sure that you actually remember those things and you try to incorporate those things into your practice. And being a part of a collaborative like Dr. Chu's is one way you can do it. It's something practical that you can do to maintain that sense of wanting to create a a more just world that every student that we've interviewed in the last two weeks, they're all like, yeah, you know, talking to patients and listening to patients and taking their, you know, their experiences into account. They have all the right answers, but then I see them at their fourth year level and it's sometimes that gets lost. Hey, how come you just didn't ask the patient what they thought? You just (laughs) assume that that's what they wanted. Anyway. And my, my last point for this one, Gopi and Romain, is it's it's our collaborative. I really want this to be our collaborative where it's not associated with any one person. It is really associated with people who want to make a change. Well, I really appreciate both of your time. I think this is such an important topic. And we tell uh, our, our residents and fellows, our medical students, you know, stay grounded. But it also comes from us, too. I think that having articles, these discussions, asking and pushing him. Well, did you ask him this on the consent? When you use the translator, did you still make eye contact with the family? Like there's little details or little ways to kind of day to day to also kind of, because we can t- say tell them those things, but we also have to create the environment or resources to help them as well, to help each other, right? We, if, especially for those of us that are interested or, because otherwise you're right, it's very easy to get caught up in that quote elite status and you're just kind of a, a robot and you're charging the Tesla and, you know, whatnot. I mean, I, I, I get it. I That's what I was doing for a little bit. So anyways, so thank you guys for coming on. For our listeners, please reach out to 
Dr. Alex Chu and Dr. Romaine Johnson, if you're interested in the Health Equity Collaborative. I, Dr. Johnson, I know is on Twitter. If you want to tell our listeners about your socials and then Dr. Chu, how, if our listeners want to get in touch with you. Yeah, I'm on Twitter. Email me, A-C-H-I-U at K-U-M-C dot E-D-U. Uh, certainly put it on your website, Gopi, and, and, and put my Twitter handle on your website. And I think mine's already on the website, but I'm on Twitter and LinkedIn, uh, email address Romaine period Johnson at utsouthwestern.edu. All right. It's a wrap. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable ENT on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable ENT is hosted by Gopi Shaw and Ashley Agan. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Taylor's Version Hess and Yvonne Arvijinsky. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Administrative support provided by Jimmy Lee Kennebrew. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.